Okay, so welcome to the lecture of today. And today we will go a little bit deeper into fractals. Uh, so kind of study um, how can we assess the um, fractal level of a fractal, how much fractal is a fractal. And to do so, we will define the concept of dimension, of fractal dimension. And we will see that it's possible to define fractal dimension in different ways. And um, these different ways, not always correspond one to, uh, to another. So we will see a, a little bit different definitions of fractal dimension. And maybe an example when these different definitions of fractal dimension do not give the same uh, dimension. So the idea is that a fractal is an object which has a dimensionality that is um, not a natural number. So if you have a line, the dimensionality of a line is one. If you have a square, the dimensionality of a square is two and the dimensionality of a cube is three. So these are all integers dimensionalities, but fractals have a, have a dimensionality which is non-integer and can be fractional, can be rational. Uh, and the idea behind this is precisely the fact that while um, polygons and, and, and shapes in normal Euclidean geometry, um, they have a definite, they are also defined by the um, ratio between the surface volume and the, um, and, the, and the perimeter, for example, or by the uh, volume in three dimension and the surface. So by the ratio between uh, their volume in a given number of dimensions, and their volume in a, a one dimension less. So this is a property of normal uh, geometrical structures. Um, for fractals, we have seen that um, the perimeter, for example, of a Hox snowflake, so of a fractal, uh, it's infinite. It's in principle infinite. So because it's, it's, it goes like this. So you cannot really define dimensionality in that way and the properties of the fractal in that way. And, and so we will see the consequences of that. And then what we will do, if we have time, uh, I hope we will see the counter set and the devil's staircase, that is the counters function, that is a very special case of fractal, which has very deep mathematical implications and interesting um, applications in, uh, in chaos theory. And then we will see how fractals are defined by complex maps. So this is also the connection between our first set of lectures about one dimensional maps and this fractal. These fractals can be seen as uh, maps that instead of being in the, um, in the um, rational number, so instead of being uh, not rational, sorry, in, in R, in, uh, in the irrational number uh, set, they, are, they live in the complex. Uh, field. So that's, that's, very, that's very interesting as a tie-in and then, uh, but I don't know if we will, able, we, if we will be able to see it today. Okay, so to kickstart our engine, I think we can have a little look to something fun to kind of, kind of kickstart our day and um, kickstart the day and remind us of the previous lecture. So in the previous three lectures, we've seen uh, maps and how do chaos arise into maps? That is when the Lyapunov exponent is positive and the map is, uh, does not have any periodic cycle. And another property that it has to have is that the map is non-invertible. I, I didn't delve into it because um, when uh, the Lyapunov exponent is positive and it does not have any periodic cycle, then the map is non-invertible. In, in other wo words, it has to go up and down. Uh, so two values, uh, one value of x plus one has to correspond to two values of x. And uh, the chaos can be seen in these kind of stretching and folding dynamics. I've shown you in the tense map that corresponds like stretching twice, 
in one iteration and then folding in another iteration and then again stretching twice and folding the stretching type and folding and this is the principle why how you do the danish pastry so first you make the dough and then you stretch it let's go a little bit faster i don't know what he's doing yeah it's, it's still stretching the dough and then you kind of yeah in this case the guy puts two four yeah the butter in between but the point pr principle is that it folds it uh, right there so if you kind of follow i found once a, a very nice video with a danish pastry with chocolate with chocolate um, in the dough and that makes it very easy to follow the chocolate chips like points in your mouth and um but yeah if you can if you can imagine that you put a chocolate chip in your dough in a given point then the chocolate chip will be folded and then you will stretch it again and fold it once again so if you put and try to follow two chocolate chips going in your danish pastry and try to follow their uh, their distance it will be a very complicated function because according to the if they get folded or not at any given iteration they will end up in different folding numbers and therefore they will uh, their function will evolve in a very different way even though they started up pretty close by so i think this is kind of appetizing for breakfast but you sweets get breakfast salty so maybe it's not appetizing for you it's too heavy okay so let's stop the sharing very good so let's see uh, let's share the screen right now then um share screen uh yes okay in the meantime does anyone has any questions hopefully you wake up a little bit you had your breakfast why does it requires me to install a plugin okay so hopefully you have woke up so if you have any questions please ask either uh, in chat or even better by talking and make me feel a little bit less alone okay so let me check yes i'm recording any questions no okay so if there are no further questions we can go on so we see in last lecture <coughs> a little bit more in detail <coughs> sorry very much so a little bit more in detail last lecture we've seen how this fractal called von Koch curve uh, or Cox curve is um, representative of um, the coastline uh, dynamics. So it's, it's very similar to how the coastline between north and south of Stockholm is shaped. And therefore it is filled up by dividing the, the, the original length you take a, a length that corresponds to the air-to-air -air distance in your coastline, then you divide it by three parts, in three parts, and then you make up in the center an equilateral triangle that has side L divided by three. So in this way, the total length of your cock curve at the first iteration would be four times L divided by three, like here, and then you can go on and on, and each of the segments you divide it again in three parts and make up the triangle making it a square of four divided by three and then a cube of four divided by three and so on and so forth in other words this correspond of taking a given yardstick and measuring your coastline and according to the length of your yardstick measured in this funny little um, way of the total distance divided by three to the power of n different iteration you will get a length that would be four uh, four to the nth power of the yardstick length and this can be rewritten as a power law very conveniently so the power law here means that there is a power dependence 
on the length of the yardstick. The, 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 the length of the perimeter will be given by um, a power function of the length of the yardstick. And the power in this case is one minus the logarithm of four divided the logarithm of three. So if the power alpha here, that represents how, what is the power relation between these, these two quantities, between the perimeter and the length of the yardstick. Um, if this is positive, is, if this power is positive, then what it mean, means is that <coughs> um, you will not have basically this power relation mm -hmm. and um, your perimeter will not depend in the same way to the length of the yardstick. But um, if you have a negative power here, so if this coefficient alpha is uh, larger than one, then you will have this power law dependence. And this will, this power law creep up a little bit everywhere in, uh, in nature, both in, in, uh, in uh, biology, um, physics, and even economics. So this is a very universal behavior that kind of mimic self-similar structure. So as you can see in the cock curve, if I take this cock curve here, it's exactly the same as one of the segments of the, of the, iterate, of the next iteration. So if you zoom in into one side of the cock curve, you will have a self-similar structure repeating itself over and over. And whenever you have this self-similarity uh, structure, um, then you will see power laws. And this happens in, in physics, like for example, for molecular clusters, or happens even in economics because uh, the economic relations between entities are kind of self-similar, or, uh, or at least in some way. Uh, a person interface with another person in a similar way as a uh, bigger entity like corporation inter interfaces with another corporation. So you have the self-similar structure kind of reproducing itself also in economics and geography and many different human activities. So this is kind of fun. And now for this lecture, the first thing we will try to do is kind of generalize, generalize this uh, concept and kind of figure out um, how the, uh, we can derive this coefficient to the power law in a, bit, in a little bit more systematic way. And what does this coefficient tell us about the structure of the uh, fractal in this case itself? Okay. So if you have any question, please ask right away. Or, or any feedback if my if my volume is too low or whatever, just write it or or ask. Okay. Good. No takers to the offer of asking questions. So let us do now um these these um these derivation so uh, uh, the same thing that i told you qualitatively about uh the fact that a line and a square have dimension one and two let's do it in a little bit um in this way let's let's derive the the, the dimension of the line and the square in this way so if we take a line Okay, let's do like this. Let's try to see if, no, doesn't like me enough. I am um, too, this command in principle should make a line, a proper line, very straight, but uh, doesn't, it doesn't recognize my lines as line. So if we have a length, a stick with these legs, so a line with a given length, then we want to find out the dimensionality of this object. So one way we can do this is by considering the fact that um, I can divide the length 
of this line in, for example, three pieces. So like the Cox curve, but it can be four. It's, it's absolutely no problem. I do three because it's easier to draw uh, because four is a little bit more boring to draw, but it's not, uh, it's not related to the Cox curve at all. It can be any different division. So if we divide this line in three different segments, then we will have that the sum of these three different segments will give us back our line. So in other words, the length of this line um, to the power of the dimension of the line will give us the length of the line divided by three. So our, our division or by four or by n to the power of the, the length of the line itself times the number of segments that I need to sum to make up this number. So in this case, it's three, okay? So this is very, an alternative way of, of, of writing and deriving the dimensions of things. So in, in this case, it's obvious that the line is equal to one. Let's consider, so in other words, this, if I divide the length of the line in n segments, then I will always go back to the total um, volume of the line. It's a volume in one dimension. So this is kind of a measure of this. I can do this the same with the square. Okay, this is, does not look very much like a square, but no matter. So if I do the same with a square, its surface, so the volume in two dimension, so its surface will be L square, and we know it. But uh, how, can we, how can we see it in this similar uh, circumstance? It's, it's very much similar. So we have the length to the power of the dimension of this object. So the surface in a given number of dimensions will be given by Again, I can do this division that can be by three or by N. If I divide it by three, what I obtain are nine liter square. So if I do L divided by three, I divide my yardstick by three in the square. How many objects do I get for this operation? Oh, yeah, I get nine, okay? So in other words, I get n to the square, L divided by three, D, uh, sorry, L divided by n, D square, okay? So in other words, the dimension of the square is two, okay? This is very easy to see. So this is a way you can do it for the cube, and then it holds up also for higher dimensionalities. It's, it's absolutely a general way of deriving the dimensionality of the, ob of the object, you divide the scale by an integer number and you see how much um, objects you make up when you divide the scale. So this is, um, this is very uh, intuitive, I would say. I hope it's intuitive also for you. Let me see if you have, so you can use these you can use these uh, reactions if you think I'm going too slow or too fast. I remind you this, you're not using it very much in the course, uh, but you can use these reaction to answer me yes, no, go faster, go slower, or if you need a break, or if you want to cheer me, <laughs> if I say something particularly nice and funny. Okay, so um, by clicking participants, and you do this by clicking participants. So uh, don't be afraid to use it so I know you are alive. Uh, you don't have the screen on, but uh, I don't want to force you. But uh, okay. So let's do the same, the same, exactly the same thing for the Cox curve. So if we take this same reasoning to kind of the fractal that we've seen, this is the Pon Cox curve.
what we have is this if you remember if you remember we have the yardstick of a length l i know i cannot do like this on this so we have a yardstick of a length l and then i can divide it into three equal pieces and construct the equilateral triangle i just say it so you should remember what i said a second ago so uh, each of these is length l divided by three okay so if you do the same thing the l of the dimension of the cock curve will be given by in this case l divided by three by the dimension of the cock curve and then how many objects do we get of this l divided by three of the uh, perimeter in this case of the cock curve this will be four okay so by the same reasoning the dimensionality of the cock curve in the same way that I derived the dimensionality of a line to be one and the dimensionality of the square to be two the dimensionality of the cock curve would be the logarithm of four divided the logarithm of three and this is equal to 1.26 and yeah approximately equal to 1.26 okay so if you are still following me you see that if i define and derive the dimensionality in this way of objects what i get is that the dimensionality of the cock curve as i anticipated is not it's greater than one because the perimeter of the cock curve grows um, as a power law respect to the number of iterations so it's not it's not fixed uh, but this dimension is not two it's between one and two so it's this rational number uh, irrational number between one and two and this is kind of interesting um, and yeah i don't know if you've seen this before in other courses but uh, i think it's quite interesting to consider the fact that dimension doesn't have to be not only doesn't have to be one two three as in our everyday uh, experience but it can it can be higher up four five six seven dimension uh, this is quite common way of parameterizing stuff uh, but it can be also non-integral so this is interesting now to to be a little to do a proper general definition now we apply the same reasoning but we divide it into smaller and smaller uh, size so if we take this and divide it for smaller and smaller sizes then we will get um, a more rigorous definition so that will still apply to the object we are very familiar with like um, like lines and squares but also to other objects like uh, if i take a, a a shape of a of a circle here i take a circle with the same area and everything and i divide it, and i take my yardstick to be a third of the original yardstick this is a little bit uh, non-trivial to see how the the dimension of the circle will be will be um will be two or if i take another polygon it's uh, it's not easy but if i take this dimension smaller and smaller so as you can see for the square and the line this is really trivial that this is completely independent of the of the n that i take i can i can take n that goes to infinity and the dimension of the line will be still one and dimension of the square will be still two and if I take a very, very small and I take n divided to infinity, so I take an infinitesimal length in the case of the circle, for example, then I go back of doing a, basically a, an integral. I, to, I go back integrating the, uh, um, the surface of the square compared to its, uh, and, and compare it to, um, compare the total area basically to the uh, result of the integration of, in, of infinitesimal pieces so this is absolutely no problem for the 
shapes that we are very familiar with for having two dimensional, one dimensional, three dimensional, and dimensional shape. Let's see how this goes for the fractals, because for the fractals is a little bit more delicate because if I take here instead of three, uh, sorry, so if I take here instead of threes, I take uh, four. So if I divide the length of the yardstick by four or five, then uh, the results for the cocker will be a little bit messy. But hopefully if I go to infinity, I will recover something, uh, the, the same values, and I will still be happy. So how to do that? So it's, um, it's fairly, fairly um, intuitive, let's say. So if I have a, um, an object, I define the box dimension in this way. So DB stands for, let's, let's write it here in red, box dimension. in the same procedure, but so the box dimension is given by the number of uh, objects. So it can be uh, segments in a, in a line or, or surfaces in uh, little squares in a surface or little boxes. This is why it's called box dimension in, um, in 3D and the mathematical general name is box because then if you go to higher dimensionality, these will still be called a box in the same way that a, a sphere in higher dimension is still called a, a sphere. So um, I take the number of boxes that I get by dividing my length, my original scale length here into a given number of of yard sticks. So I take this delta here, where delta is this factor I multiply the, uh, my original length by. So the, le the delta in the, the examples that I provided above would be one third. So the, and, and this is basically the length of the yard stick. So if I generalize this, then what I get is that delta at the box dimension um, would be equal to the number of, of, of boxes that I, that I make up my coverage uh, simply because I can simplify this and this, okay? And this means that, let's write it here in the following, let's try to keep the same size. Okay, so um, this is the same of, the, of saying DB, I, I apply the logarithm in both, um, in both uh, left and right, sorry, I'm taking delta on the other side. So this is minus the logarithm. So this is the minus of the uh, dimension times the logarithm of delta. This is equal to the logarithm of n to the delta, okay? So of the number of boxes. Mm, I went a little bit overboard. Let's see if I can, I want to be, still have to learn to properly manage this uh, virtual blackboard. Okay. In the meantime, I hope that everything is clear. And if it's not, please, please, please let me know, okay? Good, so if we do this, then this is the same. I, I rewrote exactly the same thing. As you can see now, this is independent from the um, size of, of my original uh, system, okay? So I can take a larger or smaller uh, square and the dimension will be still two, uh, exactly as I, as, I, um, as I expect, and then, as I, as I said, the definition of the box dimension will take the limit for the number of, 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 of divisions that they do of this object that goes to infinity, okay? So let me enlarge you here. So if I take the limit of the number of boxes that goes to infinity, it means the limit of delta that goes to zero, 
of this object of the logarithm of n delta divided by minus the logarithm of delta. Okay, so this is the box dimension. And um, one way of seeing it is basically covering your object with um, squares, with, with the little squares, and then take the limit for the size of these squares that goes to infinity, exactly as basically making an integral. And this gives you the dimensionality of the object. Okay, so if I do this, um, if I do this, then I can see, I can calculate that I will still have the same result. So the dimensionality of the line will still be one, the dimensionality of the square will still be two, and the dimensionality of the cock curve will still be logarithm of four divided by three. Okay, so any, any questions up to here? Is it, is it clear? Yes? Most of you are making breakfast still. Okay, good. So if it's not clear, please let me know and stop me. But basically that's the box dimension. We're going very fast today. I woke up uh, brisk. I hope not to kill you. And um, so basically fractals will generally have a, a, a smaller dimensionality than the um, than the, the, the dimension where they are defined. So in the case of the, of the Cox curve, this is defined basically in two dimensions because you construct this triangle. So the, the, the dimensionality, that, the dimension that you need to construct this is two. Um, you can build up fractals in one dimension or three dimensions or four dimension, whatever. You can do many different things, but the, it, it's constructed in two dimensions and the dimensionality of this fractal is 1.26. But, uh, and generally speaking, the fractal that you kind of see as fractal, so this cock curve is very much, um, Uh, I hope uh, I hope the recording is going okay. Um, I hope, uh, yeah, because I, I changed a little bit the setup, so I'm not sure about the recording, not completely sure. If uh, there is a risk that uh, Frey will be on my, the recording instead of me. <laughs> so, okay, that's, uh, that's still fine, hopefully. Uh, and, uh, but um, apart from these, so I will see the recording during the break. And um, so I was saying that this box dimension uh, and the dimensionality of the fractal is usually smaller, it, not is usually, is smaller than the dimension in which the fractal has to live in. And is often, especially for this fractal that you, that you find pretty in a sense. So you have this qualitative aspect of, of fractals that you, that you can see the self-similar structure repeating itself in a not too trivial way, let's say. I, I'm not going it uh, into, I'm not speaking very precisely because uh, this is also something to take into account, the fact that there is a qualitative aspect about fractals that is alluring in and of itself and a beauty of, this, of these objects so for this object that you find beautiful and non-trivial, like the Cox curve, usually this is uh, the dimensionality of this fractal. It's, um, it's not integral, but you can also have fractals with an integral dimensionality. It's, it's not forbidden to have fractals with an integral dimension, simply because you, you follow up this construction and this way of evaluating it. It's just that these fractals are usually pretty dull. So for example, if we take a square, okay? If we take a square and then we construct the fractal in this way by dividing the square into four smaller square, 
where the length of each square is L divided by three. And then you have some space in the middle, L divided by space three, and L divided by three space in the middle. So you construct it like this, and then you go on and on, and, and this will be smaller and smaller, like this. So I can zoom in. Let's do this. And each side of this would be L divided by nine and so on and so forth. But so here I will have a four boxes of L divided by three uh, size. And here I have 16 boxes of L divided by nine and so on and so forth. And if you do the um, calculation, so no. So if to the calculation of this, it's uh, box dimension would be the uh, the number of squares that I need here. So if I do this, the number of squares that I need here. So um, L to the power of uh, of this. Why change the the. the L to the power of this dimension will be given by the number of, of squares that I make up. So this is four. And then I will have L divided by three times the dimension here. So this will dimension will be pretty much similar to the, uh, to the Cox curve actually. So you see that an object that looks more like um, more like um, a, um, in a different way than the Cox curve has still the same dimension. I think in the in the book this is cited as an example of dimensionality one uh, of box dimension one. And right now, maybe it's because it's morning and I'm a little bit uh, unwinded, but I cannot see how this has dimensionality one. So it might be a, there might be a typo in the book. Um, yeah, I'm not super sure about this. So, but this you can, you can view it as an exercise, calculate the dimensionality of this and, and have a look at fractals with ha which have an integral dimension. You can for sure build a fractal where you calculate the surface and then you consider, you find out that the dimensionality of this is, is actually one. The box dimension of, of a fractal that lives on a surface is, is an integral number and, but, and that integral is one. This is definitely feasible it's just that probably I'm, I'm misinterpreting the book right now and, and, and uh, I'm a little bit uh, too early in the morning for counting fractions. I'm very bad with fractions in general, but with the morning, I have a coefficient of difficulty, which is even higher than usual. So, okay. Let's say this feels like a, a good spot to take a break. And after the break, we will go back. Well, we're not go back, we'll go forward and talk about another way. We can calculate the dimensionality of a, of a fractal, which is the, and define the dimensionality of the objects, which is the Hausdorff dimension. Okay. Any questions regarding this first half? No, no, okay. If you don't have questions, we can take, uh, yeah, we can afford uh, a full break. So we, let's do the, um, so let's stop, go back to recording. Okay, any, any questions? No.
questions at all. No questions. Okay. So let's see. I have a question. Yes. Uh, maybe we'll get to it. Oh, I have double sound. Wait. Uh, maybe we'll get to it. But uh, what does the dimension say about uh, the properties? What is it? Why is it useful to know the di dimension? So this is a good question. I'm sorry I didn't got get it across. The fact is that um, qualitatively, this dimension make up, uh, in a sense, the fractal content. But if um, it's related to the power law. So as you can see here, it's not, it's not easy and it's not trivial to relate the dimensionality to the power law. But as you can see, for example, in this example, the dimensionality of the, of the Van Gogh's curve is exactly the same as the coefficient alpha that you have here. So logarithm of four divided by three. So the dimensionality of the Koch curve will give you an indication of, um, of the behavior of the power law of uh, related to the length of the fractal respect to the size of the yardstick. So this is exactly what uh, the box dimension mean in uh, usual cases. Um, but so qualitatively, the more dimension a fractal has, uh, the more a structure in a sense, the more covers the whole dimension. So if you have a, 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 a as you can see, this dimension is 1.26. So it's relatively low between uh, one and two. So it does not cover the surface that well. So you can see that the Cox curve. Sorry, could you share your screen? We don't see your screen. Ah, I'm very sorry about that. Yeah, you're right. So screen share, iPad, and then screen mirroring. Okay. So I was saying that the dimensionality of the Cox curve that, that um, I derived here, so this was not the full derivation, but we, we've seen that if you take the size of the yardstick that goes to infinity, the, well, the, 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 the segment size that goes to infinity, you still get the same proportionality factors. And uh, therefore the Cox dimension, the box dimension of the Cox curve will be uh, 1.26 and so, so the logarithm of four divided by three. And as you can see, this is exactly the uh, dimension of the power law here, okay? So this tells you the relation between the length of the yardstick and the perimeter uh, or the length of the, of the Cox curve following it uh, line by line and, uh, and tells you the slope of the power law. So for the length of the yardstick that goes to zero, your power law will tell you that it goes to infinity, the, the perimeter, as it should be for fractals. But how fast this goes, this is given by the factor here of the power law, which is related, which is basically the, cox, the, the box dimension. So this is the usefulness of doing this. Uh, of course, it's not, it's not as trivial as I'm selling you uh, at this very moment. This is why I did, not, um, I did not stress it that much because the thing that you have to stress is that there is no universal definition of fractal dimension. There are several definitions. And these several definitions for most uh, physical cases, for most cases which you are interested in, in physics and in, uh, in other applications, in applications, the different definitions will uh, be exactly the same, will, will give you the same results and will be uh, almost trivially related, it will be related to these um, power law dynamics. But that's not always the case. There are, there are several counter examples and you can see them in the textbook. I will not do it because they're very difficult to draw and maybe a little bit confusing. And uh, yeah, it's not very useful to, 
to go through it in a lecture, in my opinion, but you can read it in the book and a little bit everywhere, cases where box dimension and this new one that I'm up to defining you right now, the outdoor dimension, um, cool, uh, are the same. Now, in the case of Cox curve, the Cox curve has applications, as, you, as we've seen in the study of uh, coastal lines, in the study of uh, snowflakes, for example, very famously, the Cox snowflake. So it has many applications and therefore it's, it's relatively well behaved and this is usually the rule. But it's not easy and each dimension has its drawbacks. So for example, in the example that I did, uh, that I tried to do here, so that I was not, um, I did not uh, explain it properly because I considered this length of the, of the, of the squares to be a third. Okay, I define it like this and then the dimensionality is non integer. But to define the length to be a fourth, so the, dimensionality, the resulting dimensionality will be one. Okay, and uh, what confused me is that in the book there is a drawing that looks like divided by thirds, but actually it's divided by fourths. And also there's a tilting there, but uh, that's no matter. So the dimensionality depends on quite small details in a sense, but that are quite important and will also determine the power law behavior. So this structure, what does it do? Basically uh, does not have a power law behavior respect to the, uh, well, it has power law behavior, but it's trivial respect to the um, to the surface area. Okay. Any any further questions? Did I answer enough? Yes, that was correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's not, it's not uh, as, as I wanted to say, it's not straightforward. And, and this is also why uh, this is part of the, of the beauty of this subject is the fact that it's not, uh, it's not trivial. It's not written in stone. And even with these quite fundamental objects uh, like fractals or, or if not fundamental elementary objects like fractal, uh, you can have, you can see different non-trivial mathematical behaviors and definitions that should intuitively give the same value actually don't. So this is uh, also part of the beauty of this subject. And chaos in general is a little bit like this. The definitions are either very complicated, but uh, of, of not particularly useful um, yeah i mean I, I don't want to be imprecise in saying this kind of general statement is almost like a, a popularization of the subject but the uh, dynamical systems and chaos has this as, as a very non-trivial nature in in a sense that um demonstrating something formally mathematically formally it's quite complicated, something of use and something interesting, it's, it's really complicated, can get really complicated. And to be, to make a really formal definition of something that is even elementary as the properties of, of the logistic map or properties of uh, the fractals. So for example, yeah, uh, this is, this is non-trivial. This is highly non-trivial and can be a topic of research, topic of current research. I have the, I have a, a, a friend, a colleague, uh, his name is Maurizio uh, Monge with Isaiah Nizoli. They published, uh, yeah, I don't know if they published finally. It was on the archive like four, four years ago. And then it was very long to publish because it was a very formal, very mathematical demonstration of precisely the relations between chaos and the, the fractal dimensionality of a very characteristic chemistry reaction. 
uh, that is one of the examples that is written in the book. Uh, so, and this demonstration, this very formal demonstration was like 40, 50 pages long. And, uh, and it's, it's very complicated to follow and to study. So even something as trivial and giving it, given for granted nowadays in all practical application, the fact that, for example, this chemical reaction has a chaotic behavior, to do it properly, mathematically, and demonstrate it, it's a topic of current research that takes uh, three or four people working for years to kind of give a final demonstration of, of the non-trivial nature of that, because this is what you are actually demonstrating, the fact that the object that you're studying is, is intrinsically non-trivial, as a very structured and complicated behavior uh, to the point that it has all these properties of sensitivity to initial conditions and uh, non-invertibility and all of these interesting um, mathematical properties which define a behavior which has still a lot of structure but is highly non-trivial and this is yeah this is difficult too so the, the whole course i'm trying to balance a little bit the formal aspects for the easiest thing things so trying to go a little bit more formal more precise in the where it's possible but not bore you with uh, super mathematical and formal demonstration that are really hard and then gets you gets us not very far away concerning the physics of it how can we describe systems how can we describe complicated physics and how can we use mathematical methods and numerical methods to model this complicated structure system okay so after the um, nth time that I maybe repeat myself and the philosophy behind the course and the, and the subject, maybe it's boring for you, maybe not, repetita juvent, they said in my Latin class, uh, that repeat, repeating helps. And um, I, I whipped on the chat, so we can go on. If you don't have any further questions, we can go on uh, by defining the Hausdorff dimension. Is it okay? So this is another possibility, which is relatively similar. What we did here with very, very small boxes, we are going to do something similar for spheres. So kind of see the packing, the way I can cover a given set that represents in the, for example, the Cox curve, how can I cover it with uh, spheres? So before I did it with, with squares and I was taking small squares like this, and then I was using the small squares to kind of find out how many squares do I need. Now we'll do it for spheres. So. I will see how many spheres of the given size do I need. And the relation, the, the special thing about spheres is that they basically represent distances. So what I'm doing is uh, directly investigating the metric of an object by the means of distances. So, okay. Um, to define it properly, this Hausdorff dimension and this packing of spheres, what we have to define first is the so-called Hausdorff, let's rewrite the name. I hope I'm writing it, spelling it correctly. Hausdorff with two Fs, this I remember. The Hausdorff content. So the Hausdorff content is defined in this way. So is the limit, again, for the scale that goes to zero, where the scale in this case is not the size of the cubes or the boxes, but is the size of the sphere. So of the sum of the number of um, spheres, of the sum of the spheres, then I need to cover 
a certain set. To, the, to, a, to a given power S. Um, so this is um, this is the metric content of the sphere that is defined basically as the length delta. And S is a J power, is a given power. This is this is um, delta is the diameter of the sphere. Sorry. So I pack, I, I cover my, my set that can be a fractal or not um, with, a, with spheres of given diameter. The, and the diameter of the sphere is at least a delta. So actually this is the minimum diameter of the sphere, it can be a little bit larger. So this is the volume of my, uh, of the sphere. Um, so I have the sphere, I label it with the number I, and then this is the volume of the sphere that depends on the, on the dimensionality. And I want to cover with this sphere my set my fractal set. And S is greater than zero, this is just an exponent and is part of the, of the definition. Okay, so now the dimension, uh, the Hausdorff dimension, am I, yeah, I'm a little bit too zoomed. Okay, the Hausdorff dimension then, is uh, given mm -hmm. let's write it like this by a little bit by a little game played on the exponent s okay so um, so the house of dimension will be the the s that divides the behavior of this Hausdorff content. So it's the S so that the Hausdorff content of, uh, of, of a given S is um, infinite, infinity for S that is less than the Hausdorff content. And the Hausdorff content, uh, sorry, for S that is lower than the Hausdorff dimension. And for Hausdorff content will be equal to zero for S that is greater than the Hausdorff dimension. Okay, Hausdorff dimension HD, uh, sorry, DH. DH, okay. So this sounds a little bit like a, a little mathematical uh, game, but it's pretty powerful. So uh, for example, is it, is it clear uh, the definition as it is, I hope. So, but, but now we will do an example. So if we do it for the straight line, so let's, let's do, uh, this is not straight at all. Tuck. This is a little bit straighter. So we have the straight line with a given L, okay? So the Hausdorff content of the straight line will be given by the limit for the minimum diameter that goes to zero of the sum of the volume of an n number of, sphere, of spheres, each of the sphere will have a given volume and then I will elevate the power of s. Now, the volume in one dimension of a sphere in one dimension is the distance. So that is the diameter, okay? So this is delta for all spheres 
if I take it, uh, if I take the, um, basically what do I have to do is take the, 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 the number, the maximum number of spheres that I have to take. And then it's the, the way that I can do this. So uh, would be this delta. So yeah, sorry, I, 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 I misspoke. So I will have to take these spheres with a given diameter delta and the diameter in one dimension that is the object that I'm trying to reproduce, the volume in one dimension would, would only be V diameter. So I can draw this like this, but as long as I just play in one dimension, the actual volume of the sphere will be this, okay? I hope this is clear. So I will cover my L with the delta number of spheres, okay? And the maximum number of spheres that I can take with minimum diameter delta is by taking all of them having the minimum diameter. So uh, what I will do is to take n spheres of diameter delta and, and then elevating it to the power of x. How many n do I need? How, how many do I need? Well, this is simply um, the limit. Sorry, it's okay. The limit always for delta that goes to zero. How many do I need maximum is just the length of my segment divided by delta. So this is n and the sphere will be all the same with delta to the power of s. Delta is the volume in one dimension of a sphere that is the distance in one dimension and S is the exponent, okay? Is it, uh, I hope it's clear. I, 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 I did a little bit of a, I, I tangled with myself, but I hope it's clear enough. Mm -mm -mm. Okay, and then what we have to do is to study the behavior for uh, of the Astor dimension, so of the Astor content for different S's. So the, in other words, the Astor content is the limit for delta that goes to zero. I can rewrite this as L times delta to the S minus one, okay? So delta is, uh, is small, it's, it's way, it goes to zero. So it's way smaller than one. So basically, the result of this would be that the Hausdorff content goes to infinity when the delta goes to zero, when if S is greater than one, okay? So I have a positive exponent and this will make it, uh, sorry, if delta is the smaller than one. So I have a positive exponent, a negative exponent in this case, and delta is, is, is lesser than one. So this will, um, this will uh, make the Hausdorff content goes to infinity. And then the Hausdorff content will go to zero if S is greater than one, okay? If, if S is greater than one, then the exponent is positive. And then I have a small number elevated to a positive exponent uh, will go to zero, okay? So that follows that the Hausdorff dimension is the value, here is the definition, so is the value for which S, when is smaller than the Hausdorff dimension, will go to infinity, and when it's larger than the Hausdorff dimension, when, when S is smaller than the Hausdorff dimension, the Hausdorff content will go to infinity. And when it's large, S is larger than the Hausdorff dimension, the Hausdorff content will go to zero. And this is exactly the situation we are in right now. 
look at that with the uh, with the splitting number with the number that makes the difference to be one so the house of dimension of a line surprise surprise is one it's a very complicated way of defining it or it looks very complicated but works and it's an alternative way of defining it so for von Cox curve now is it, is it uh, is it clear and do we go to von Cox or do we have any questions here von Cox do you see my screen everything working fine I see somebody clapping thank you very much for the cheering and it seems that that is clear that this is the dimension of the line is one both the classic dimension that we that we are all very familiar with and then both the box dimension and now we discover that also the outdoor dimension of the line of this very familiar object is one could you explain how outdoor dimension is equal to one with the outdoor okay so let's see let's do it once again so that it's crystal clear. So I define the outer content with this that looks like um, a little bit of a mathematical um, of a mathematical um, trick. So from one to n. So I will I define the outer content by having my set my the the set that i want to uh, cover so this is a coverage of a set and set can be a shape like a square or a line can be a fractal can be also something else some, can be data but let's stick with shapes that are easier so i have a um, set which is in this example is a line and I want to cover it with spheres. The spheres in one dimension is just the distance between two points, okay? The sphere in two dimension is a circle with a given surface, and uh, it basically represents all the points in, two in a two-dimensional set that falls under uh, the circle. That, that means that the, all the points that are closer than a certain uh, distance that is the radius of this sphere of the bubble this is also called bubble in mathematics uh, so the bubble in in uh, in uh, one dimension is the just the distance the bubble in two dimension is the distance in two dimension that defines the, the circle that is the bubble in two dimension or the sphere in two dimension and then you have the bubble in three dimension or the sphere that is the distance in three dimension and so on and so forth to progress to higher higher dimensionality in uh, i studied it when i was a student as bubble the general concept of spheres but uh, i see that is also used just the word sphere so uh, so that's the idea it's it's just the same thing that we did for box dimension where we covered it in small squares that are very similar to what is a measure in the Lebesgue uh, type of measure, if you are um, literate in mathematics. And now we are seeing it as distances. You know, we are translating it into another concept with these distances. Now I take this diameter of the sphere, delta, and I take a given number of sphere, the maximum number that I can pack in my given set. And then I take the limit for the diameter of the spheres that go to zero. I take smaller and smaller spheres, exactly the same as I took smaller and smaller boxes. Because this enables me to pack uh, stuff that is complicated, it is shaped in a complicated way, and it, uh, like fractals, for example. And then I take this exponent, s. So I take the volume of the sphere and I elevated it to a given exponent. And this exponent will be the key of the Austor dimension. And then uh, the volume of the sphere of uh, this exponent will give me a given number that corresponds to uh, the volume uh, exponent, the, the exponent of the volume. And then I sum over all the sphere. 
that I labeled i. So I sum for a given number of spheres. And this number of spheres goes from, uh, the, the labels goes from one to the total number. And the total number is n. And I want to maximize this n. I didn't write it. So I, I have to take the limit of the number of spheres that go to zero, maximizing n of this thing. It's a bit complicated definition, but it's relatively intuitive. And now what I take is the value of the exponent that separate this out, outdoor content from infinity to zero. So this is a way of defining this, the dimensionality of a given sphere coverage. And the dimensionality of the sphere coverage then is given by the number that discriminates when the outdoor co content goes to infinity and the outdoor content goes to zero. In the case of the line, I did the calculation, the diameter, uh, the, the volume of the sphere in one dimension is just the distance or the diameter of the sphere, delta, and then I take the distance to the power of s. And then I take the maximum number of, of, of distances of sphere that I can pack on the line and the maximum number is n, where the distances is always the same, okay? And then I take the distance that goes to zero. Then I have this formula. So this is just the outdoor content will be the limit for the distance that goes to zero of the num of L, that is the total length of my line, times the delta, that is the distance, to the power of S minus one, where S is this magical exponent. And this gives me the fact, the solution of this limit will be infinity, when s is smaller than one and will be zero when s is larger than one. So one is the value that separates the outdoor content from going to infinity to go to zero, okay? So this, if we represent the outdoor content in like this, this will, will be a step function when it's zero and here is infinity. I mean, this is a little bit of a cartoon, but uh, you can get beside it. And this is the Hausdorff dimension, exactly the value that separates that. And value that separates that is for, so this is the H, uh, sorry. A why is not writing? Okay, sorry, H, S, and this is S. Okay, this is H, the outdoor content in function of this exponent S. And the value that separates in the case of the line so is just one. So the outdoor dimension is one. Okay, good, clear now. I've been a little bit long-winded, but uh, I think it's fine. Um, so, is it clear now? I hope it's clear to everyone. Let's go. Let's go further then. Then, and um, let's calculate the house of dimension of the von Cox curve. So let's do something which is a little bit less trivial. So the process is exactly the same. So I have to take the outdoor content, which is the limit for the diameter of the bubbles that goes to zero of the of a set of bubbles and the sum over all the volumes of the set elevated to a given power. This is not S, this is I. So this is just the label of a, of a bubble. So this is bubble, for example, in the case of a line, this is U1 this is u2, and so on and so forth. Okay, so how to do this? Again, the maximum packing will be for a given, um, for a given number of, um, of, um, of spheres. So let's consider it this as n. Let's, let's just generalize it and then take sphere of 
equi, uh, equidiameter. This is uh, a little bit a formal way that we will never use. So we will always take equal diameter because that's the usual way I can maximize the number of, of, uh, of, 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 of bubbles. But in some special cases, you might need to take bubbles of different sizes. But if we take bubble of the same sizes, that is the usual way that I can maximize this, it's just the number of bubbles that I have that I don't know what it is related to delta, uh, at least not right now, elevated to the power s, okay? Times delta elevated to the power s. Delta is again the volume of the bubbles. Now the volume of the bubbles in the, Vox co in the Cox curve, since the Cox curve is still a line, it goes, it spans two dimensions, and then I cover with two dimensional line, but the coverage, the volume of the coverage is still a line, okay? And the volume of the coverage, therefore, is still the diameter of this line, so it's still delta, and then to the power s, because this is, I take the volume of the coverage elevated to the power uh, to calculate the given outstore content for that specific power. So that's like this, I hope it's clear, and then, we remember that we've seen something like this regarding the Cox curve and that we are very familiar with. And this is exactly the power law that we've seen the other day. It's delta to some power and A, where A is a factor in front. So I don't care about the factor because I only care about the power or the factor that depends on the power because that's what, what will give me the infinity or not. The factor in front doesn't matter, doesn't play any role because it just multiplies the infinity or multiplies zero. So it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. Okay, so if I take the limit of this that goes to zero, then, uh, sorry. So, this is, uh, we defined it as uh, S minus alpha, okay? Good, because I substituted, um, I substituted this, this factor with alpha, with the power law above. So in this way, HS is equal to infinity if, S is lesser than alpha. S is lesser than alpha. Oh, now I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about infinities. Uh, well, S alpha, okay. And then HS is equal to zero if S is greater than alpha. Yes, a little bit strange alpha, but that's fine. Okay, therefore, the dimensionality is the value that separates, which is alpha, which is the logarithm of four divided logarithm of three, now that you're very familiar with. So for the von Cox curve, alpha is equal to the box dimension, it is equal to the house door dimension. And as I say, this is the most common situation for all uh, fractals that have uh, relevance in, uh, in, uh, in the description of systems. Of course, you can mathematically, as I told you, you can define pretty strange fractals that behave in a more complicated way. And in these cases, in general, the Hausdorff dimension is always smaller than the box dimension. So it can be equal, and this is the case for most uh, realistic systems, but it can be smaller. It can never be larger. And this can be demonstrated pretty easily, considering, uh, considering the definitions and the fact that the box is a box. Uh, so the coverage of boxes is always 
larger than the coverage of, of spheres of a given diameter. Coverage of boxes of a given side length. Okay. Is it clear? So if generally bad pedagogical to introduce something new in the last 10 minutes, but I want to flesh it out so that you can think of it because this is something that is very mathematically fascinating and uh, interesting and absolutely yeah it's um has a lot of properties which are really almost a mystery i mean they are completely counterintuitive and that's um uh, and that's actually why these uh, construction that I will show you now, it's very, 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 very often taken as counterexample of almost everything in mathematics. I mean, uh, it's the counter set is something which is a beast. It's, it's a monster that is, uh, has properties which are completely pulls your intuition on, on what is continuous, what is a, an interval, what is a continuous interval, what is a rational number, and what is a measure in, uh, in the Lebeg sense, what is a measure, and completely upside down, because it's, uh, it's something which has a fractal nature and exploit this um, dimensionality, this strange property of, of, um, of non-integral dimensionality to um, have a, uh, a measure which is um, to, to, to cover the whole, uh, an interval, any given interval, despite not having a measure, having a null measure. So if you do an integral of a function over the Cantor set uh, and you calculate its measure, if you calculate the measure of the Cantor set, you, you will have zero. So if you but nonetheless, there is a correspondent to, from every element to the counter set to every element of the interval between zero and one, which has measured one. So this is kind of completely counterintuitive. It's constructed in this simple way. Let's take uh, then. I really don't understand why this doesn't kick in, but okay. So let's take an interval between zero and one. Okay. And now let's do like this. Let's construct as usual that we do for fractals in an iterative way, iterative way, the, um, the next way of, of writing it. So, the, sorry, the, 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 we construct it iteratively as we usually did for fractals in this following way. It's we take a third and we take a term here and here. So this goes from zero to one third. Let's write it on top. I don't know why it goes with a different and two thirds. And this is the first iteration. And then the second iteration we apply this principle of taking away the third in the middle over and over again. So it's similar as we did with the von Koch curve, but we don't fill the middle, we just leave it empty. And it continues iteration after iteration in this way. Let's not do the other one. And then it goes on and on. So the length of this object, what is the length of the object? So the length of the object um, L, 
yeah, L0, this is L0 is one, at the iteration zero at the starting point. L1 is two thirds. L2, now I divided the two, the two thirds again in two thirds to the two. L3 is again two thirds. You should be pretty familiar with this reasoning. So iterating Ln after n iteration, the length will be two thirds to the n. So I will div I'm dividing these and then measuring the length and this will be the length. And the interesting thing is that if I do an infinite iteration, this will go to zero. So therefore, this set has zero length, zero measure, in other words. And, um, but it's um, all homeomorphic, let's, let's use this word, homeomorphic, so that means basically it can be mapped. There is a one-to-one -one correspondence then with the interval, the continuous interval zero one, okay? And this can be seen in plenty of different ways. Um, so I have five minutes and I leave you the ways that this can be seen, that, that it can be seen that Cantor set is homomorphic to zero one. It can be done either with a decimal representation, basically. So it's very easy to see that you have here a representation which is basically in base three. So you have a given length, a given interval one, and then you can choose where to follow here, either um, how to map this interval into this base of three. So zero, one, or two, in other words. And then you can map the next interval in zero, one, two, and zero, one, two, three. So it's zero, one, two, three, uh, again, zero, one, two, three. So it tells this correspondence iteration by iteration to a representation in decimal figures in base three. So I don't know if I am explaining it. Um, I mean, it, uh, it's, um, yeah, let's, let's just flash it like this. So it has a correspond, this um, counter set can be seen as zero because the first one is zero and then a number between zero and three so let's write it like this zero one two three uh no the the, the commas confuse you oh well that's okay zero one two sorry so it can be either zero one or two and for the first and then zero one or two zero, one, or two. So following this representation, I have a correspondence with the decimal notation in base three. So it's a, it's a notation in base three, so it's not decimal in principle, but, uh, and this can be converted very easily, okay? So, for example, if I do zero comma one zero two. So that means that these objects, so zero is just always the case. One, so th this is zero one. And then the next step, 
sorry, one, it's a little bit confusing. I, I, will, I will let you think of what does it mean to have one. Zero, two, and zero, two, let's say. This number is represented in the Cantor set by zero, this is two, and this is zero, and, and then here it would be again one, two, three, and this is two, okay? So this element of this fractal represent this number in the decimal notation, in base three actually, in a base three comma floating point notation. That's, that's how, you, how you should say decimal. No, uh, oh my God, okay, oh, who cares? floating points. And the same can be said by it's homomorphic also to two to the n to this set that is the uh, base two. So this is more familiar for people that are familiar with computers. So you can always choose if to go left or right here, and you can construct the same, even easier to construct a floating point binary notation, either zero or one, either zero or one, either zero or one. So you can basically, by picking an element of this set, what you can do is to have a correspondence to a base two decimal representation, like it is in our computer. You have a binary representation, like in our computers. And in this way, you can, rep and then you can convert it both these two ways. You convert it to decimal if you want. This, of course, not, uh, not needed, but uh, why not? Uh, it converts to decimal, and then you have whatever number that you wish. That belongs in R between zero and one. Okay. So in this way, we have demonstrated that despite the fact that the Cantor set has uh, no measure as zero length, can still have a one-to-one -one correspondence to whatever element of the continuous um, interval between zero and one. And that concludes the lecture today. I even went a little bit longer, but uh, I think this is uh, something that you can think of during the weekend. Fill your nights by this realization that you can map a continuous interval into a discrete, basically. What it, that's, it's not discrete, that, but that's what it looks like. Into a continuous interval with a given measure, you can map it and it's homomorphic to an interval with zero, with a set with zero measure. So that's uh, something to think. Questions? So let's stop the recording in the meantime and I